five, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Art of Move podcast with myself, Anthony Manuel, my good friend, Dr. William Raybar. We are also joined today by CEO and founder of Functional Patterns, Naudi Aguilar. We are th- still trying to find the grand unified theory of human movement, biomechanics, what it means to live in the human body and move properly in it, how to live a good, healthy, functional life. Uh, We are stoked to have this conversation today. We are going to be talking a little bit about the nature of evidence, what qualifies as evidence, how culture impacts how we form beliefs, how the scientific community looks at evidence, how the public looks at and values evidence, how the fitness industry and fitness community looks at and values evidence, and what that means for us as human beings trying to figure out how to move and how to be how, how to live a functional life, essentially. So Will has prepared a little bit of a, a sort of a visual demonstration to sort of lay a framework and lay a foundation for some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. If you guys are watching live, we have a live chat going in uh, No Filter Network where you can actually type stuff in the chat. Uh, if you have questions and stuff, we're going to hold off until the end. You can still, I'll still be f- fielding the chat and stuff. We'll still be looking at what's going on. And if there's some relevant points that are that come up in the chat, we'll address them as we go. But for the most part, we're going to stay focused on the conversation today. Will, do you want to s- share your screen and we can sort of segue Absolutely. into sort of the, the framework of, of where we're going and maybe even giving people sort of a background of why you, uh, what got you thinking about this stuff? Yeah, well, uh, it, it's a huge topic, right? Like, what is science? You hear it thrown around all the time. Um, most people don't know how to separate the word science into different parts, like what the public is thinking, how uh, academics use it, how the fitness world uses it. And uh, this is really a way to separate everything, okay? So I'm going to try to be as thorough as possible, but um, I want to keep it under 10 minutes, okay? So... Um, I'm going to go with the slide here and I made some points, but I kind of like to freestyle. That's just how I do things. Can you guys see this? Yeah, we can see that. Okay. So it's a bit, it's a bit small for me to be honest, but I'm not sure. Maybe I push the button in the middle. I hope, I hope, I hope it's it's going to be harder to see on a mobile device than, uh, than a computer screen, but we'll, uh, we'll be, we'll be pretty explained. I'm going to go through it. Yeah. So uh, the first part is what is true knowledge? And that's really uh, epistemology is kind of the nerdy word for it, right? What is true knowledge? And uh, is the scientific method the only way to know things, right? So that begs the question, what is the scientific method? In its bare bones, it is theory. You theorize about something and you have to draw that from a paradigm. You observe something, okay? There's a, a debate on which one goes first, but I'll put theory observation second, experiment, and then repeat the experiment. We've laid a whole bunch of other uh, variables on top of this, like statistical value and um, peer review on top of this, but this is the bare bones uh, way to go about it. Theory, observation, experiment. Okay, so back up to the top, what is true knowledge? Uh, There's other ways to know things. Okay. And that's logic. That's one way that's huge. And I feel like that's very lost in today's world. Um, being actual logic or, uh, having logic and, uh, going from point A to point B in a logical manner. Like you can know something because your mom told you so, or you can know and have a justified belief about it because you went through the steps to know that you knew something. Okay. And, uh, really that goes into induction, which is a philosophical term for um, basically how how do you come upon your theories? Okay, so I can go, I know the sun is going to come up tomorrow because it's come up tomorrow or it, it has come up every day that I've been alive. So I know it's going to come up tomorrow. Can I prove it 100%? Probably not, but I can induce that is that is going to happen. Okay. So I feel like this is probably where functional patterns lays in the, and, and I can't say for certain, you're going to have to tell me, in how it conducts its methods to know what it knows. It's like, I've seen this happen over and over and over again. So this must be the case. Okay. And uh, let's move on. Uh, now, the consensus of the majority of the academically credentialed experts is known as the body of knowledge. I feel like that's where the experts are at. We we have a consensus here. 
on what the peer review science says, and this is the body of knowledge to draw upon, right? So that doesn't do well for people outside of the academic system, okay? So you can't participate if you're not a credentialed expert, Mm. or you must go to the body of knowledge and argue there. So practically, whenever I get in a debate, a paper's thrown at you, and it's just like, let's argue this. And as soon as you step into that world, you're only arguing the paper, okay? You can't go outside of that. And that draws the paradigm into a box, okay? So um, so in a practical sense, there's repeatable results. Again, I think FP falls into this. In the field, it's like I see something happening over and over and over again. This is a reality-based way to go upon things. This is, you know, you're actually working with a human being and not just theorizing. I feel like right now the uh, scientific field is very theory heavy and only going into labs and being very, uh, they only see what they can see in the lab and not in the field. So again, I think FP is in the field and seeing repeatable results and there's nothing wrong with drawing conclusions about that. Now, the question is, how do you go upon the scientific process with that? So um, why the scientific method? Why the basic scientific method? You're trying to find a cause and effect relationship. You manipulate the independent variables. You have an independent, dependent variable. And uh, to really know something is the cause of the effect, you have to manipulate that cause to change the effect. You basically manipulate the independent variable And find out if it caused an effect, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can induce that that was the cause, but you can't 100% prove it because it may have been something else, okay? Like that might be a little bit confusing, but that's the best way I can sum it up. So, yeah. Again, you, you go back to the theory and you have to draw from a paradigm. And this is, this is huge right here because um, in a previous episode, we talked about Thomas Kuhn. He is a um, the prominent scientific thinker, philosopher. And you, if you go outside the paradigm, which is the collection of theories and knowledge that scientists have in a field, then you're in trouble. You're proposing a new paradigm. So that's when you get into power dynamics and power struggle. And again, I feel like FP may be there. Because when you don't have the same theories and you're drawing upon a whole new theory, it really bothers the, the system that's currently there. The most powerful system is the collection of knowledge by academics at the current moment. That is what is almost agreed upon silently in society that that's what the body of knowledge is. So again, if you go outside that paradigm, you're proposing a new paradigm and that's where you can get in trouble. Um, going back to a practical example, let's say knees over toes, um, long and strong muscles go really well with the current paradigm. So there's no problem there. It fits in well, even if he's not an academic, it fits in well with the current paradigm. It won't ruffle as many feathers as chamber sequences or fascial recoil or, uh, concepts that are outside of the paradigm that are being tested by scientists. And again, you would say, Hey, they are being tested by scientists, but is it the consensus? Probably not. Okay. Um, back to observation, you draw observations from the natural world to draw a a hypothesis in the first place, new tools available in the last 15 years, slow motion on your phone. This has changed the game. Uh, this is not the same as observing in a lab. And observing in the lab is not the same as observing in nature or open source, okay? Again, those are tools, new technology that has changed the game. Experiment. You must must have the proper methods to draw the conclusions that you're drawing. And I feel like this is a problem that I see all over the place. Because when I go into the methods section, that's usually the first place I go to when I'm looking for out of paper. It's like, could you really draw the conclusions conclusively from the methods you used in this paper? That's usually the question I ask. And uh, 
repetition is huge in this. You have to repeat your experiments. I don't see that being done on a, on a large scale. And that has a lot to do with uh, funding. And uh, a lot of people just don't want to re- repeat research. And false dilemma uh, falls into this category, like uh, Joel Seedman versus Mike Isriatel on whether you should go full range or partial range on your squat. It's a false dilemma. Should you be squatting in the first place? Right. That that is not even a question being asked. So I'm I'm saying that a false, uh, there's a, false a lot dilemma, of false dilemmas. A, a false dilemma is a false dichotomy where, like, it's an informal logical fallacy where people will erroneously limit what the options are. So, like you said, it's like full range of motion versus partial range of motion. They're still testing within the, the paradigm of lifting specifically as it pertains to training. So they're they're artificially limiting the options for what is you know more pertaining to truth, essentially, just to give a little bit more context on that. Keep going, man. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'm almost done. Um, Other topics here, falsification or proof. Uh, Should we go to falsify our theories? Should we try to do that to prove something? Or should we just offer more and more proof, like induction I was talking about earlier? Another topic is who owns science? Can I do science outside of academia? Like, if I put together a scientific method, a very good uh, study using uh, what I'm showing here, can I pre- present it to the public without going through the institutions? Because right now, if it's done outside an academic institution, it usually has to be verified through the institutions to be put into the body of knowledge. So you have to wait to get validated. And that happens to, um, it, it just takes a long time, basically. And you have peer review, right? So if you're coming outside of the paradigm, no one's going to peer review you in the first place. And you're just going to be put, if you do get your study published, it's going to be put in a journal that's of lesser value. Okay. So that's basically the, um, the summary on the scientific method itself. Is there any questions there or uh, I'll do, I'll do do like a sort of a recap of kind of what I understood after, after you're done. Sure. Okay. So this one is, we could be more interactive with this one because uh, um, it's just going to go through what the public, the academics and the fitness world, uh, how they look at science. And this is more on the cultural end of things. The last one was more on the scientific end of things. Mm -hmm. So the public, I feel like the public looks for what will solve their problem in general. And they go to the expert first, if there is one, if I have a plumbing issue, I'm going to go to a plumber. Right. So um, and in general, the public has a background respect for science. So if they see credentials they are like, oh, that's even better. Right. But they do want to have their problem solved. So it may not be an expert that they go to. OK, an expert being a credentialed expert. OK, they want their problem solved. And if they see in their face that their problem will be solved, if they're convinced immediately, they'll probably go there. OK, so um Public also has an affinity for marketing, gimmicks, and uh, charlatanism, right? This is one of the points that, you know, the science-based community says, hey, this is why you need to listen to the experts, because there's a lot of uh, charlatans out there, and we need a standard that we can go to uh, that makes sure that you're protected from people trying to take advantage of you, okay? And peer review is that, um, that point there. And the public is obviously prone to fads. Like that's a, you see that everywhere, right? Uh, Yoga and CrossFit and anything that's popular for the time, the public is prone to that. Um, Any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Anthony. I'll follow. You want to keep that open there for a sec? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, like I, I work in marketing, right? And so I kind of understand that the, the goal of most people when they're presenting their ideas to the public is to make it clear that they have a solution to a particular problem. You know, fundamentally, that's that's what marketing is fundamentally is identifying a clear problem and then communicating that you have the solution to it. You try to emotionally connect to the people. You try to establish that you understand the pain that they're going through, and then you present a very clear solution. Fundamentally, that's what marketing is. Now, if you understand that principle and you know how to communicate that, even if you don't actually have a a real coherent solution to someone's problem, but you convince them that you do, (laughs) then (laughs) then you can can make a lot of sales and you can convince a lot of people that your method is, is all that in a bag of potato chips. And what you can do is you can create a narrative about 
you know, people, people will buy into what it is that you're talking about and they will believe the marketing more than they believe the results of what's happening. That happened with me and veganism. I, I remember I, I like went hook, line and sinker into the whole vegan thing about how it was, you know, uh, environmentally destructive. I had like my, you know, my books of peer reviewed research saying that a plant-based diet was like, you know, the healthiest, lowest risk for heart disease could reverse diabetes, all this stuff. And so I went hook, line and sinker, but I was not even paying attention to my own deteriorating health. Right. And so I focused, you know, I was so bought into the marketing narrative. I was so bought into this, you know, this, uh, this sort of idea that convinced me of truth that I, that I ignored reality. Right. And so a good marketer basically can make swaths of people ignore the reality of what's happening in front of them. And that's, that is the danger of, of, you know, people who are very, very good at marketing and create strong narratives is that they can like basically make it so that people ignore the fact that they are experiencing detrimental results from following through with what's going on. Like people want to believe the law of attraction stuff so much. They want to believe that positive thinking can solve all their problems because it, you know, because it feels good to believe that. And so, you know, people who who will will take advantage of the fact that it's like they're offering a simple solution to a complex problem and they'll believe this so much. Meanwhile, their lives are like spiraling out of control and they're not actually, you know, they're broke and they're they're wishful hippies, stoners that still have all these problems <laughs> who are just sitting there trying to like vibrate their way positive into into changing their lives because marketing is basically constantly trying to convince them that this is going to be a solution to their problems and they want to believe it and so there's there's narratives there's entire narratives that form around you know these these groups of people that want to believe this stuff because they've been indoctrinated to a certain way of thinking this is something that i've noticed right like i i try to pay attention to like buyer psychology a lot and my I try to understand my own psychology in terms of how much I've I've been duped by good marketing, which I have been a lot in my past, right? Like I've been duped a lot by good marketing. So you know yeah, and I, I think I think that um, one thing that's really hard in, in this industry is trying to determine what works from what doesn't. Like if I have an issue with my plumbing, like fixing an issue with plumbing is easy because you know like uh, would, because those systems that existed for, you know, thousands of years now, they've been around for a long time. So we can, and, and we build them from scratch. But the thing is we can't build a, a human body or a living organisms scratch like cell by cell. So it's more complicated to fix a body than it is to fix a leak in a house, or it is to, you know, fix some, like some kind of a structural issue on the house, because you're also dealing with the, with the fixed system. The body is dynamic, it moves, it's really complicated and never mind that you have, you know, you have associative memories that like your, your brain is involved in all these different motions. There's emotions that are involved, trauma, you know, generational trauma. There's so many things that create complication in the body. And so what people don't think about as it relates to getting, when they think about solving a problem, they think in terms of, Hey, look, like my hip kind of hurts. And then I do this stretch and then the pain goes away. Oh, problem solved. I'm good. If I have a plumbing issue, for the most part, if, if, if the plumber is pretty good, that plumber is going to solve the problem and it's probably going to be fixed for at least, I guess, another 5, 10, 15 years, depending on how long that is. As it relates to these stretches, the, the benefits don't last that long. As, I, as you guys probably have seen as, and I've, I've been talking about for a while, it doesn't work for that long. So I think the the problem is, is what does it mean to work? I think I talked about the last podcast with you guys that functionality is is constantly like there's there's no but a, functionality is not a fixed concept. It's ever changing. Hmm. We're always refining and, and making things more efficient. Right. Like I t said before, an internal combustion engine works. But there, there are negative externalities that are associated with, you know, dumping, you know, carbon monoxide into the environment on such a repetitive basis. There, there are negative externalities that we need to account for. And so ba relative to that negative externality, we need to find other ways to, pr to not repeat that problem that uh, internal combustion engines create. So from that vantage point, it's the electric uh, motor or like the electric motor that, you know, an electric car might be a better alternative for that specific thing. Uh, is an electric car perfect? No, because to manufacture an electric car, it requires a lot of energy consumption and that ends up creating a whole heap of pollution. Is it a step in a better direction? 
I would say I would say that it is, but it's always it's always we're always improving. Functionality is emergent; it's not fixed. And I think that in as it relates to um, what it means with, with training, like I I don't necessarily think that people who do squats or deadlifts or people who who use the the traditional knowledge base are inherently completely wrong. It's just they're they're wrong for for they're right under a narrow box or in a, in a small box, but reality is a much bigger box. Hmm. And the variables that they account for just are, they're limited. They don't, they only go so far. And I experienced that. I, I, I am a guy that likes to tinker. I, I like to mess around with things all the time as it relates to like techniques. And I, I went to different uh, certifications way back when I first started as a trainer. I had, a, I had a, a, an assortment of different trainers that I knew who had credentials, master's degrees, and things of that nature. And uh, when I, I got so many ideas on training, I tried so many of them, and then I started realizing that some of them kind of worked, while the other ones didn't work at all. Or even if they did work, they worked for a very short period of time. And that's kind of what, what were they going to get? It, it's, it's like, it's, it's. To go back to my my my, my original point, it, it's hard to determine what actually works. Like mm-hmm. what what actually works, and we and we always have to add the time dimension because that's the one that that has mattered more to me than anything. But it's, it's like it's one thing if I train clients. Like if you're let's say if you're a personal trainer and you're really good with sales, as you were talking about with with marketing, Anthony, you're really good with sales, but your follow through sucks. You could still make a living for a while if you're in, in a corporate gym, continuing to continuing to sell people and make a great living. I saw trainers who did that. I well, was good at sales. Yeah, go ahead. I, I also want to say, you know, when you say it's hard to determine what works, I think it sort of begs the question: works for what? Right. So, for example, with the, the with the personal training example, you get a really good marketing and really bad follow through, or you could have really good follow through for a short period of time. Right. You could be you could have a really good sales tactic, get a person, you know, 10, 15 pounds of weight loss by putting them on a crash diet, putting them on a really extreme program. You don't see the fact that all these people are gaining the weight back two or three months later or they're injuring themselves with the extreme uh, training. Uh, but, you know, and so for a lot of the times it's the it's the quick fix. It's the simplification. When you're talking about that narrow box, right? That narrow focus, that sort of kind of ties into what Will was talking about in terms of like, well, what is knowledge? Well, there's this general academic consensus about, you know, what movement is, uh, how it relates to, you know, like movement reality, how we need to train to to sort of like uh, optimize for that sort of thing. Um, and, and so if you're, so, so there's, there's the few things, right? If you're only looking through that narrow box, you're not considering all the other variables of, of, um, re, you know, movement reality and the situations that you need to be prepared for. Right. So you're not, you're not even going to consider. Think, I think the main one to consider is time though, that people don't account for time that over time, that if you implement a, a, something that, uh, that is addressing a, you're tr- that's a, trying to address a problem, um, that, as you were saying before, Will, the, the, if you're trying to change the cause, right, to, to get a, a different effect, that they people don't just look at time as it relates to exercise. Like we look at time with pharmaceuticals, with drugs, with different other like chemotherapy. We look at the don- long-term effects of that, but mm. we aren't measuring the long-term effects of certain exercises, certain stretches, or the rep- repetition of these routines that are done. They're all very short form. And to me, that's what I've kind of liked that, – when, when it comes to something working, what's mattered to me is, does it work over time? It's like in five years, will it work just as effectively or better than it did the first year? And like with functional patterns, you'll see that people will be around it for a while and it, they get better the longer they do it because they develop more precision in the way that they understand how their body operates and moves. And so over time for me, like the, the, again, that long-term approach like okay the the fact that there's an absence of longitudinal studies is greatly concerning to me in the field of exercise and rehabilitation they almost don't exist there's very few that are out there when i talk to the research team i'm like guys uh where are the longitudinal studies they're like i want to see something and they're like they might be some on cardio right but in general you they're always like at, at most like six months long something like that like you need in order to get really good data on something and to really understand the benefits and, and that whole notion of adaptation. If you are at adapt, if you are having adaptations, to, when, when you adapt to a stimuli and you repeat that stimuli over and over again, it becomes neurodegenerative. From my experience, that's what I've seen. 
If you get really good mm. at something and you repeat it over and over again, it actually has counter effects. And I think that I believe BF Skinner goes in on this, which and he was like one of the most possibly the most influential behaviorist of all time. And he talks about that if you essentially have an animal master a set of commands, right? You teach it to do a certain few tricks. If you repeat those tricks over and over again, it damages the animal's brain. If I remember correctly, I might be misquoting that. But from my vantage point, it's never about I never I never try mastering a skill because it, I always focus on trying to I always fo try and focus on always diversifying my skills. And then mm. when I diversify it in, in ways that relate to the skill that I'm trying to diversify, that thing gets better. So, so, so can I, can yeah, I just, uh, just to, just to reflect back that, that point is really interesting to me because I remember having a conversation recently about neuroplasticity, the idea that as you get older, your neuroplasticity decreases, you're less likely to be able to learn skills like languages and new skills in general. You, you, you know, you become more closed off to other information and someone pointed out, it's like, well, it's not necessarily that as it's not an aging issue. It's not like just like physically you age and then you become more less, you know, less neuroplastic. It's that specifically people People fall into these routines and these patterns and they do the same things over and over and over again. And because they're in this, this neurological groove and, they, and they're, you know, they aren't learning new things. They're not being exposed to new environments. Um, you know, th I think there was like the, there was one study or something that even just taking a different route home, like if you go down a different street, rather than going down the same street from, from work every day, you can actually maintain a, a higher level of neuroplasticity than if you take the same way home from work every day. And that's just, you know, it's it, like, bro, that's I, like I, I, the funny thing is that you mentioned that is I do that all the time. Like even when, when people are with me, I, I always just, I drive like random routes. I, I, I feel it in my body. I feel that. And I'm like, this feels like it's fucking up my nervous system. I need to go. I need to switch this path because this is not good. I need, I need to like, I need to alter this. So yeah, keep going. That's, that's amazing. Well, yeah. And so, you know, I, I remember, I know, I know we're not, uh, I know you're not the biggest fan of Ido Portal, but one of the things that he said, I, I think was that the more you specialize, the bigger of a price you pay for it. And he used the example right. of, of hyper, correct. hyper adapting to not just like a physiological and like a physical adaptation, but the neurological adaptation side it's like, you know, that's why he was a movement generalist for the most part was for the neurological adaptations that came from diversifying his movement practice as much. as I he actually did. want to interject on that whole idea of adaptation because it's such an important topic. You know, so often we hear of this term of like, you know, forced adaptation or adaptation in general, but we never talk about mouth adaptation. Mm. So the whole thing is you just like you can do all you can have an assortment of different things that could have benefits for you in terms of the way that you challenge yourself. You can also do things that are the exact opposite of that. So, for example, if you if you overload your body in a way that it can't handle th that, that is and it's not handling it correctly and you're not learning proper weight distribution, proper pressure, you are going to maladapt. And then it's going and no matter how much you try varying that stimulus, it's going to be damaging to you. And that's one of the parts that with Ido Portal, why he doesn't. That's why he's in pain from what people have told me. Students, I've had a lot of his students come my way over time, many of them, a great deal of them. And they told me how much he himself and the people that were around him were constantly suffering from injuries. And so we, th this, that term maladaptation is one that is not used enough in this field. And I think it needs to be thought about a lot more. It's like the body doesn't just adapt. It also maladapts. And when you look at what humans have ultimately become and the fact that testosterone levels have dropped like 50% in the last like 20 years, that's a byproduct of not adapt. Well, I guess that you could classify it as adaptation, but if it's corrosive to our, our neurophysiology and our biology, I would classify that as a form of maladaptation. Mm. So, so I, I think that that's something that needs to be uh, discussed, right? So I, I think that goes against a lot of what's coming up right now. I see with in the you know therapist physio world where it's um, movement optimism, basically just get moving and you'll you'll do just fine. And um, what's your take you on that? You shouldn't get. Well, I, I think you can just get more precise. I think that on a base level, there is a human blueprint to movement and walk and things that should be prioritized, like walking, running, throwing. So. Don't just move, be very specific about how you do something. But on the flip side, I get that we shouldn't stop people from just entering the game. You know what I mean? So but how it are depends we, on Will? how are you tell me, bro, if we just simply tell people like I'm gonna ask you a question. Yeah. Let's say you wanna you wanna start an investment portfolio. Am I gonna tell you just throw your money everywhere, bro? And just just hope for the and you the know what, you're doing fine. Is that a good way to start? 
Yeah, no, it, it's not, right? And it, it would be the most general way to start possible. Is it a good way? No. And again, I, I agree that we should be very specific about how we do things. And I think we're talking about different populations there. If we're talking about a whole nation, maybe that's a good policy because it's just a lot of people are just on the couch watching TV, very on the whole, you take a hundred million people and you know, there's 50 million obese people or 30 million obese people. Yeah. Maybe uh, as a policy in a nation, let's get people to move. Let's do some, right. But as, as it regards, this, really, this is a really good conversation. I want to interject. Keep going, keep going. As it pertains to what's the best way to do things and let's avoid these maladaptations in the first place and try to adapt to a blueprint of how the human is supposed to move. And I, I in, assert that there is a better way to move than others. Like lifting is different than moving, than putting your body through space. Okay. Like traditional lifting. So let's figure out what the best way to do it is and go with that. Okay. Yeah. So, so with, with that in mind, as it relates to the whole body fat thing, if you, I, I just want to interject on this. How, what, if we look at health metrics and where we're going, like, like, let's, let's, let's think about how long, like, fitness has become, has been pretty mainstream on a general basis. It's been on TV, it's been all over the place. And what has been the, the MO the entire time that, you know, you, tr that you should burn more calories than you consume, right? That you should go jump on a cardio machine and then eat less. How well has that been working as time has progressed? Have people gotten leaner and skinnier utilizing those approaches that we use in America, in America? Because that's really where it's pushed the most. It's not pushed that much in Europe, and they don't have that, that many issues with, with weight loss. How about Japan? Like, If you go to Japan, are there many overweight people in Japan? I've been to Japan. You don't see very many overweight people there. But yet we don't see this narrative of, hey, you know, calories in versus calories out. It's just in their culture to, to have more moderation overall. I don't think that this this approach that everybody first and foremost, I don't think people are having issues as it relates to um, to body fat because they need to go into the gym. I think that people are having issues with body fat because they have a, a struggle with moderation and understanding what functional moderation is, and that that's really what the problem. That's the problem that that our society is facing altogether. We don't know moderation. So when they say, hey, just get people introduced, get people involved, I think it's more discouraging for them to take that approach. Because if you come into the industry thinking, hey, look, I'm going to just work out and then I'm going to start dropping body fat by adopting this calories in versus calories out approach. And let's say you get a little bit of results. Eventually that plateau comes. And when that plateau comes and you're like, wait, this is a lot harder than I was anticipating. That's where it becomes really, really difficult to, to figure out. Whereas if you operate from the framework that I, that I present – and just telling people, look, you need to learn to make peace with life and stop lying to yourself and just understand that you can make this a lot easier than what it is. You're just going to feel a little bit uncomfortable not being able to eat. You'll have to be a little bit irritable. And while you're doing that, you have to change your mechanics. So you change your impulsivities and that will then make it easier for you to neurologically, neurophysiologically deal with these circumstances. People are dealing with emotional crises. That's what they're dealing with. They're not, they're not dealing. And, and so unless they sort out their emotional problems, most of the time it's not going to work. And I know Anthony, for you, it did work out that you got involved, but as I see it, bro, you're an exception to the rule. You said yeah, that you course. were overweight at some point, right? Yeah. I weighed, uh, when I was 15, I weighed 287 pounds. I was, wow. uh, I was, I was very, very overweight. Um, and I'm about 185 now. So about a hundred pounds lighter than at my heaviest, right? You're, you're a success story. But, but that said, you kind of, when I look at your structure, it makes sense that you would, you would end up being able to pull that off. But if you look at the structure of most people, and I know this whole thing of like spot reducing is a controversial take, but every time I see some super athletic, super shredded dudes, right? I see the muscle formations and the intra abdominal pressure is very different on them than that of people who are overweight. When I look at their femoral formations their tibial formations, their cranial formations, their <laughs> cervical spine formations. When I look at all those formations, I'm like, they happen to be lean in all these places. I'm not saying spot redu reduction is a thing, but it's something to consider, right? It's something to consider. So ultimately with you, Anthony, you happen to what I classify as being an exception to the rule. Yeah, and course. that the majority of people, they, they didn't have your fundam fundamentally, the structural strength that you have in your body. And if they did... It would be, they possibly could take that approach of inclusion or whatever, but most people are not in that 
physical state to be able to adopt those measures and expect to get results. Well, yeah. I mean, Does genetically, that make sense? yeah, genetically, like I come from a, a background of like European farmers, right? So they're like very hardy, mm -hmm. uh, sort of genetic stock in terms of that. And then when I was young, I was, I was in sports, even though I like started g gaining weight when I was young, I was still playing soccer. I still did, uh, you know, some basic gymnastics stuff. And like, I was still involved in sports for the most part until I got really fat. And then when I got fat, they just, you know, made me a, a football lineman and, you know, plow into people kind of thing. I, I think all three of us were destined to not be overweight. And it's because we have a genetic advantages over other people. The question is, how do we create better genetics out of other people? Right. It's not through this all inclusive approach. You guys you know, see what I mean? I, I, I want to, I want to kind of yeah. rewind back to, to this idea of the, of the fact that people have to deal with their emotional issues principally, right? Like yes. it's, you know, their emotional relationship to food. This was something that I had to go through uh, because, you know, food was an emotional cope for me. It still is in some cases when I'm super, super overwhelmed. I still have like negative coping patterns around food. You know, it's uh, like not to the degree that I did when I was overweight. But now, the, but but the reality is the core thesis here is that people have emotional issues that they need to deal with in order to correct their problems. Now, what marketers do is they identify the emotional discomfort that people have and they speak to and appeal to the emotional discomfort that people have and propose simple solutions. You talk a lot about the biological imperative, about how human beings are subject to the biological imperative, which is inherently lazy. Evolutionarily, we are sort of motivated to conserve energy, get the most amount of reward for the least amount of effort. That is a biological imperative inborn within us. I've noticed that in myself. If there's an, a, an easier way to do it, I will find a way to do it. Um, I think most innovation actually, for the most part, is inspired by lazy people who want to do things more efficiently and not have to do as much work themselves. I, I really I'm lazy, that. by the way. Um, but yeah, keep going. Yeah. But anyway, what I'm what I'm saying is like there, there's emotional issues that people need to contend with, and that is kind of at the root of their problems. Marketers know how to capitalize and speak to these emotional problems, and they propose simple solutions that basically give people permission to outsource their thinking to non-nuanced and, and narrow, narrow focused versions of, you know, a solution. It's like, do you have, uh, do you have back pain? It's because your back's not strong enough. Do these deadlifts to strengthen your back and stabilize your hips, right? Oh, cool. Easy, simple solution. No problem. I'll do that. It's, it's not like you might have a fascial adhesion that is outsourcing the amount of pressure that you have when you step to a part of your body that shouldn't be handling the load. And so you need to do myofascial release and then do appropriate retensioning and optimize your mechanics for efficient and fluid transfer of energy. Like you start saying that stuff, people are like, bro, can I just like stretch for 10 minutes and do some deadlifts? Can't I, you know, like, can't I just, can't I just do that? Right. So, so, you know, we, we have this issue of like, it's hard to convince people to think for themselves. It's hard to convince people to, uh, you know, put the extra work into thinking about the broader scope of things, the the broader uh, vary the range of variables that we need to consider. Uh, and then, when, you know, when we're talking about like how long does something work? Well, how long does something work for what? You know, for pain relief, yes. for advanced function, for an increased number on your your barbell back squat? Like, what are you, what are you improving for? Like, what like how yes. like yeah okay. Um, I was very, very good at adding weight to people's barbell lifts and I could do it for years at a time. But like, what, what are the consequences of that? Right? Like I could, I could keep people relatively injury free while increasing their strength. And I thought I was doing a really good thing when I was a personal trainer by doing that. You know, I had all the mobility exercises. I was, I was helping people get stronger. Right. But even then what's that, what's, what's the context of the strength that I'm improving for people? I'm improving their barbell strength, their, their lifting strength, their pull-up strength, but where else in their life does that strength translate to what other things are they uh you know compensating for and other behaviors in their life and this is all the stuff that you know only in the last couple of years as we've been doing this podcast these are the types of questions that i had to start asking myself it's also why i quit being a personal trainer because i realized i was just fucking people up because i wasn't accounting <laughs> for any of these i, I did I, I was like you know when we first started this podcast i was still coaching at a crossfit gym and i was trying to throw some in the some of the biomechanics principles that i was learning into the warm-ups and stuff but I was still coaching people CrossFit classes and I was like, I can't, yep. I can't keep justifying doing this. Cause at, you know, like even if I'm helping mitigate a problem, I'm still perpetuating a problem that I'm seeing and I can't unsee it now. There, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of incentive to be proven wrong in this society. It doesn't seem to be that way. 
that if you're proven wrong, proven wrong, it usually comes with a set of punishment, punishments and not a set of rewards. And we're just not organized well enough to reward somebody when they've been di when they've been proven wrong. And I think until we somehow find a way to do that, it's going to be really difficult for people to change their positions. And that biological imperative is going to hijack their thinking until we could probably figure that out. So now let me ask you a question. Um, okay, let's say in the uh, scientific field, you prove things by going into the knowledge base and uh, finding out what the best peer review evidence is, and perhaps you may or may not do your own study on that. Then you find wh which variables did what, okay? I'm not saying it's the best method, but that's how it's done. How do you go about knowing that you're changing particular variables within FP? Let's say... Look, bro. This is this yeah. is how I, this is. I'll I'll tell you guys how I how it started for me. This is how yeah. it started. Yeah. I was 18 years old, right? And well, it started for me. I used to watch sports like crazy. I used to watch Barry Sanders. I was obsessed with Barry Sanders. I think when I was like, I don't know, I think like 11, 12, something like that. And so I was like obsessed with him, Emmett Smith. Um, I love watching Hakeem Olajuwon. I had there was programming that had to have happened before this when i was 18 years old i don't know did i talk about this when i was helping my build my parents house did i ever talk about this on the last no, podcast or no i don't think so no i because i always have these little things these anecdotes that I always speak on and then I'm, and i might just make sure that i'm not repeating myself so anyway i was uh we, we were building my parents basement massive freaking basement huge house they wanted to build or whatever you know they were migrant workers and they're like their dream was to build a ginormous breaking house and so i was helping i spent an entire summer doing that when i was 18 after i graduated and uh, i remember there was a point where I, I, we were mixing sand my parents had a tractor it was an old international tractor yellow tractor and there was a scoop on the front side of it and we were mixing cement there and then I'll, and i'll get to my point in terms of how i how i uh how how i assess function and so i i was i was struggling i would be going in there my grandpa smoked cigarettes I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day, unfiltered. Um, and then he probably drank an, on average, like anywhere between like 12 to about 20 beers a day. And he was smaller than I was. Dude's like 70, I don't even know, I'm 70 something. And so I was, uh, I was like, he would just, I just wasn't paying attention because I was oblivious at that time. You know, my youth was kind of a blur for the most part. And I didn't actually begin to develop mental maturity probably till I was, I think like 20, 21, some levels of mental maturity. Uh, but the rest of it, I was just kind of like, you know, just being like a, a regular dumb kid. And so anyway, I was, um, I was, I was like watching, I was like trying to shovel on it. He's struggling like crazy. And at some point he noticed that I was like struggling. I was, as I was trying to mix the cement on the scoop and he's like, Hey, he's like, you're doing that wrong. Come here. And I'm like, what? He's like, you're, you're mixing the cement wrong. And he didn't say much. He didn't say much. And I, he's like, he's like, come over here. And you like put your hips on the edge of the scoop. So like, so essentially the scoop was like, let's say the scoop is kind of like facing you guys and it would go forward like this. Right. And so I was scooping, I was like in front of the scoop this way, trying to like dig away at it like this. Right. And trying to scoop it around. This dude told me, Hey, look, what you need to do is grab my hips and he put them on the side of the scoop. And then from there, he told me, okay, you switch your grip on the, on the shovel and set, and, and you need to go palm down here, palm up here. And then put your hips on the shovel and then from there reach across and then from there i started getting leverage i just started doing this and i was like oh my god and i became a cement mixing machine right after that and i was like oh and he's, he's like palanca you got to find a palanca which is a lever and from that point on it completely shifted the way that i thought from throwing punches kicks because i studied everything and, and for whatever reason i don't know why but that first principle stuck with me now Ever since that point, anytime when I became a personal trainer, I thought about it in that regard, that whole thing about finding uh, th those mechanical anchors. I was actually very, very fortunate that my first fitness manager when I was at a corporate gym, um, his name is Jim Patterson. And uh, I was very fortunate to have a guy that was very scientifically minded, very oriented around deadlifts. I don't think deadlifts. I think he actually did more Romanian deadlifts. I'm not sure if he did back squats. I think he was against axial loading. But this guy taught me how to essentially almost move like a robot, but essentially to, to isolate fatigue, uh, fatigue in a specific spot. And so for me, I paid it, I, I, I drew it out of him. I had to draw it out of him by showing how driven I was. I was extremely driven to learn. And I would, not that I was doing any of it on purpose. I just generally tend to be a very naturally inquisitive person with the way that I do, the way that I am. And so 
he showed me these types of things as it relates to mechanics. And so I, I've kind of had, I, I visualize people moving kind of like the way, and you guys are probably going to be like, how dare you say this, but it's kind of like the way a crane lifts dirt off the ground, that there's balance and that there's counterbalance. And if, if you're not, if there's not a counterbalance to whatever you're balancing, then at some point there's going to be something wrong in the system and something in the system is going to break. And I, because I, because I did come from a farming background and we used a lot of equipment, I had to keep that in mind, keep that in mind at all times. Like the way that my dad would use the backhoe or my brothers would use the, use the backhoe, I'd have to make sure that that thing wouldn't flip over and they wouldn't fall inside of a hole when it come in. So already I, I was kind of already processing like intuitively uh the 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 center of the center of the center of mass on physical objects and so then from there i kind of began to apply that onto the body obviously was my vision very good from the very outset no but i and so it was it was two ways that i went about it that was kind of like my 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 first approach like looking at it but then the other approach was okay i would work with the client i would implement an intervention and then after I would implement an intervention, because most of my clients would be in pain, and that's what I became known for, I would be like, okay, did this said intervention reduce the pain? Did it exacerbate the pain, or did it do nothing at all? And if it did nothing at all, or it exacerbated, exacerbated the pain, if it didn't improve the pain, then ultimately I didn't do that thing again, and I had to modify whatever was there. You do that 50,000 times, a hundred thousand times, it's probably around a hundred thousand times out of all the sessions. Cause when I was training clients, I mean, I'd be up like at five 30, I mean, sometimes four 30 in the morning. And then I'd be done like at 8 PM and I'd probably maybe have like an hour or two hour break in between or whatever. I'd have some days where I'd get time off to play video games if I, if I had time or whatever. But in general, I was probably, I don't know how many hours a week I was training, but it was a lot of hours. And so you repeat that process over and over and over again. And eventually you're going to get not necessarily to a source code, but I believe that chamber sequences, really what it is, just more more precisely executed movement, it's kind of a, a source code to understanding how the body is supposed to be propelled in space, right? It's just more accurately depicting how the body moves in space. So you could apply the same things that the other alternative biomechanics systems that are out there employ things. You can apply functional patterns to literally everything, to wrestling, baseball, these chamber sequences literally applied to everything. And so, for, but really the, the guiding force for one, I would say off the top of my head, Will, because I don't really know it. I'm just kind of like explaining what I interpret it as. And sometimes people don't really know why they get the results. Like if you talk to LeBron James, he doesn't know why he gets all the results he gets. All, most of that's intuitive. So this is based upon what I can understand and how I can recognize it. I think it's that I had kind of like a First and foremost, a background in watching athletics from a very young age. I always wanted to be a pro athlete. That was a, a driver. And then I also had a, a farming background. And I had and, and that farming background kind of like taught me leverage principles. And then after that, it was um, me working with clientele that, that working with clientele and constantly making tweaks to get them out of pain. That got me to be at a better place. Like the times that I've had to... Um, run like uh, HBS courses or master courses. I used to run master courses that were about eight weeks long. If you could have five days a week, eight weeks long, you want to talk about a murder horn. I, nowadays, if I try doing a, a, an HBS course for three days, it destroys me. It's like, it destroys me. If I do like about two or three of those in a row, it absolutely freaking annihilates me. I was doing these things for eight weeks. And so oftentimes what you'll find with anybody who's a specialist is usually they'll, they'll pop in to train somebody for maybe about a day or two. And they'll be like, hey, try this and this, and it'll work to some degree, but then they leave right when the person adapts to the stimuli. And then uh, once they, when the person adapts to the stimuli, what that person or that specialist won't have any techniques that follow that. So when I ran these master courses, I fortunately I had a lot of techniques to show people. So there was always something to work on, but in general, like, since, since I've had this, since I've had to work with people over the course of the long term, and most of those people have been really screwed up, most of those people have been really messed up. It kind of laid a foundation for me to kind of to, to know what the body's more or less more supposed to look like. I'm not saying what it's supposed to look like, but it's kind of nudged me in the direction of okay, this is how the thoracolumbar fascia is actually supposed to look. This is how the glute, the glute complex is actually supposed to look. This is how the adductor complex is actually supposed to look. This is what proper intra-abdominal pressure looks like in this context, in this context, in this context, in this context. So really it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a product of just testing and then seeing the outcome, testing, seeing the outcome, 
testing and seeing the outcome and then just dealing with the constant slaps in the face from all the errors that you make. But and for the longest time, bro, when, when you have to run a course that's got, you know, 50, 55 people in it and you don't want a single one of them to not drop out from it, you have to learn to be really precise about everything that you teach in every single concept. And I think that's, I guess, my unique skill is that I have a, bi- a, a mental ability to extrapolate complicated uh integrated motion i guess that's what it is and i can kind of see how somebody's moving and i can almost see like a hologram of what they're supposed to move like and and what, the way the sequence is supposed to be and i'll be like that's the that's what that person's true archetypical nature is but this is where they're at now for whatever reason i can understand the transition from point a to point z probably better than most people but i just so- think that that, that came back to just having being kind of tenacious in terms of trying to to figure this out. So is your first principle symmetry? Uh, what is the blueprint of what you're trying to get to? Um, I think, kind of, I think I'll, I'll do the best that I can to explain it. So bear with yeah, me. Sure. I think it's kind of just leverage, bro. It's trying to find, uh, find, um, find a place to 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 utilize leverage from to some degree. If I, if I could see it that way, like it, it's, it's not symmetry. The, the, so when we use when we think about the term symmetry, we think in terms of like okay, there's balance between left and right. But ultimately, it, when when people move in space, there's going to be shearing, lots of shearing force in that. And so you would classify that as being asymmetrical. You see what I mean? So it's not necessarily that I'm pursuing symmetry. Symmetry is as it relates to assessing a person's body that matters. That's a part of it. Decompression in the right areas matters. Compression ma- matters in the right areas. But then asymmetry is going to pop up in movement all, all the time because that's all movement really ends up becoming when you actually uh, propel yourself through space. So yeah, in that sense, uh, asymmetry is is important too. So I guess the guiding principle for the most part is like, if I feel like I can't get any, here's the, here, I'll think, this goes back to anatomy trains and Tom Myers. If, I'm not sure if the depictions are right, but I've spoken to Tom Myers and the t- times that I've gotten to speak to him, the guy is so on point. There's a lot of people who hated on him, but if you actually engage in a discussion and you p- push him, I-, I remember I was talking to him like, hey, everybody tells me that the intercostals are for, this was back in 2016, I think it was, I think 2015 or 2014, I think it was. And I got to hang out with him and I'm like, hey, Tom, it, are, are the intercostals for breathing or are they more for rotation? Like, which one do they do more of? He's like, I would say that they're more for rotation. When he told me that, I was like, this guy is definitely on point. He's not just bullshitting. He's seeing certain things. His level of application in terms of fixing people's problems is not going to be high because he himself would tell you that he wasn't necessarily the best person at moving. And neither am I. I don't move great, but I think I move above average in terms of how I do the things that I do. I think if I if I committed myself to something, I would probably move pretty well at that thing. It's just if I make that commitment and I specialize as that whole thing with Ido Portal that he says, when you specialize, you, you sacrifice, you know, developing other aspects of yourself. Mm-hmm. But um, why, why did I bring up Tom Myers? Can you guys reel me in real quick, man? Um, what was it? You're talking about the ri- the symmetry, the ribs. We're, we're, uh, we're talking we're talking about like the first principles of what you look for in terms of functionality. In yeah. Terms yeah. Okay. Of, you okay. Know. Beautiful. Thank you. So when when Tom Myers talks about myofascial force transmission, it's like that runs through both. Like you can either call it myofascial force transmission or whatever. It's like as I see it, it's like there has to be a continuity of tension that's running across a whole line of, of muscles. It seems like to me when I can. Physically, I guess proprioceptively, you might say, when I can feel these things connect in my body, that, and when I'm about to do a motion, I'll classify that as correct. If I start feeling one area begin to burn or fatigue, and, I, and I, how do you classify what's good uh, discomfort from bad discomfort or whatever, right? But if something becomes uncomfortable relative to what I would deem as being uncomfortable, then I don't do that specific thing. And so whatever it is, I have some level of awareness. I don't know what it is, but I can typically tell when something's going to, I can tell when shit's going to hit the fan kind of, kind of thing as it relates to it with my own body. Have I still made mistakes? There was one time, this was maybe about like four or five years ago. I was really trying to figure out shearing force and <laughs> I sheared my lumbar and I was, I was bedridden or not bedridden, but I could, I was struggling to walk for like three, four days. That's one time that it ever happened in my career. But outside of that, I haven't really had anything else like that pop up ever. I've had other like metabolic issues. I've had other things that relate to my, my immune system. 
But in general, my intuition hasn't really fully misguided me. Has it been has it been crappy? Yes. I mean, who I was 10 years ago compared to who I am now is not even close. Like I could now I could solve all the I could solve probably a thousand times more problems today than I could 10 years ago. And, 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 and I would probably be able to do that in three weeks to a month month. And I could, wouldn't be able to solve any, I wouldn't be able to solve like one, one hundredth of that in whatever, like freaking like a whole two years or something. So it's like my, my intuition has gotten better progressively, but the, the guiding light for me, the first principle is kind of, it, it's a feeling, I guess is what it is. It's something that you feel and it, it you feel pressure and tension, right? Distribution throughout an entire area. And that's what's guided me. And many people have said, well, that's bullshit, bullshit the way that you do it. And I'm like, well, look at that result that we recently got with that lady that was 88 years old. Oh, that was and had Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah, had Parkinson's disease, stage five. And I did some research on it. And I'm like, wow, that's some serious stuff going on there. And I'm not saying that she reversed it, but we're addressing the problem. I'll say that. I'm not going to say that we have a full solution, but we're addressing the problem. And today, before we put up this uh, this podcast, there was this, you know, this, I don't know, like seven, eight-year-old kid or whatever who was struggling with athletics. And there he is a few, and it's not because of functional patterns. I think maybe we switched on a certain few things to help him. But um, but I'll say that we, I think FP helped him. And, and, and it also translated to that, even that kid changing his gait cycle, you know? So clearly, the, I, the, I think people have an issue with intuition, but Einstein intuited a lot of things. So did, uh, so did Newton. I think every single singular revolutionary scientist had an intuition about how the world worked. They, they didn't necessarily, they didn't even trust their eyes. The whole idea is, bro, I don't really use my eyes. I really don't even live in, like, when I look at things, I like, even as I'm looking at you guys right now, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not good at looking at things and focusing on one specific thing. It hurts my brain when I do that. I have to assess multiple things at the same time. Otherwise, it bothers my brain. It hurts. It's like, at some level, my brain says, no, don't do that. You must, ass- you must assess everything at the same time. Because if you don't assess everything at the same time in a peripheral fashion, then it's going to hurt us. And we don't want that. So for me, that intuition, like there's a lot of like intuitive, I guess you classify it as intuitive. I just think it's the way that my brain and my body extrapolate data. That's what it is. As it relates to like dealing with physical, physical struggles, as it relates to um, looking at, at people, people's body language is and in, in interpreting, okay, is that person angry with me? Are they happy with me? How can I solve their problem? What is it that I can say that triggers this person to want to be more receptive to me? How do, and in many regards, I mean, I'm really good at making people angry and pissing them off. I know how to push their buttons as you guys have seen. Right. So it's like, I've, uh, I have, uh, I don't know, something within my body enables me to probably have a, a, a different, uh, awareness than probably most people. And there's pe- other people that have it. Um, but I, I, for me, that's kind of been my guiding light. The first principle isn't necessarily clear. Right. Yeah. But no, when I, I look at, let's I'm going to try. Look, can I, can I, can I, sorry, go ahead. Go one ahead. second. Let me just yeah. do one more, one more. Well, it's like it's intuitive, bro. But when I look at like a chart that's that describes the five different types of forces, which what, what is it? Bending, shearing, twisting, uh, and then from there, tension and compression. Right. That when I look at those things, I'm like, ah, yes, and all those things make sense to me. Right. So I look at it like in, I feel it intuitively. Well, when I see it with my eyes, I'm like, yes, all of that makes sense. You got what I mean? Mm hmm. Well, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize as best as I can to try and help cre- help create like a simplified framework for for what I just heard, right? So from a yes, young age, please. you experienced something that made you aware of uh, creating leverage and more efficiency in in motion through that experience of of churning the the concrete, right? And you're like there was yes. this there was this felt experience of increased efficiency where it's like okay, if I don't have enough leverage then it's going to be really efficient in inefficient and it's going to hurt. It's going to, it's going to cause, yes. you know, un- unnecessary shit. And less so there, output too. Less output. That was the biggest thing. You get less output when you're inefficient, but yeah, keep hmm. going. Yeah. So it was a felt experience, right? And so then working within uh, the fitness industry, you had a lot of reference experience in terms of things that would produce certain results uh, and things that didn't work quite as well. And you, you, you were working with people more and more and more while also developing your own reference experience, working on your own problems to have this, again, interoceptive or maybe even kinesthetic sense of what becoming more efficient in your own stuff. You know, real quick, another thing was that I, I, my body is real sensitive to pain. Mm. And so if I feel a little niggle, it's like debilitating to me. Like my body says, ah, I, I, I don't need to go to a tear in order for my body to stop. 
So for hmm. my body, my body just more like, no, we, no, we're not dealing with that shit. And it makes me stop. I, like, if I feel the wrong type of movement, my body kind of, it doesn't paralyze me, but it says, bro, we're going to go sit down. We're not doing shit. So that's, hmm. I guess that's in, cause you, I talked about training other people, but it also, a lot of this is me training myself too. Right. But yeah. And that's, yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at As you're starting to solve your own problems. You're learning more about, uh, you know, like neuro neuromyofascia and like the anatomy trains thing. You're, you're starting to put together yes. sort of like this model in your head in terms of, how these forces are transferred, how these levers and this leverage is sort of produced within the human body, you can sort of visualize and intuit how all of these things are supposed to connect. And so when you look at another person, now you have an intuitive sense of, okay, this is how your, your, your baseline framework is supposed to interconnect. This is what your current archetype is doing. And this is where you're bleeding energy. This is what, what's going on. If everything was tied together, if everything was efficient, if everything is based on your own feelings of efficiency, based on your other results and the other frameworks that you're looking at, you, you have like a, you have like a present view of what, what the person is doing and how they're moving. And you have a, an intuitive understanding of if they fix their problems, this is how they would move if they were efficient, if they had leverage based on, on their current, you know, physical frame, like if their frame was fixed, if everything was interconnected, this is how they would move. So you have a visual, uh, you know, point A, point B intuitively based on your own experiences of creating leverage and efficiency in your own training. And, and I, people. and I think also I, I compare people's movements to somebody like a Barry Sanders or a Michael Jordan or a LeBron. You get what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of like, what? <laughs> That, that was the most mind boggling thing to me when I when my first training session, when I had my first client and I had him doing like some Swiss ball squats to bicep, uh, bicep curls. You know, like when you put the, the Swiss ball on the wall and you drop down and you do squats and then you come up and do bicep curls. And I was like, whoa, what the hell is this guy missing? Because he wasn't athletic at all. Bro. This guy was like, uh, he was like some kind of uh, uh, like a, what, what, an agent. That's what he was. But this dude was just messed up. First client I ever had. And I was like, Wow. This is insane. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what's missing in between him and me? Because I mean, I'm not that I'm a freak athlete or anything like mm. that, but I'm decently athletic. I got my genome tested and I'm like, what would they classify as like, I have the explosive genes or whatever. I, know, I think mm. quite a few people have that, but I at least have that. And so, um, but I was like, what's the difference? And then like, th that was, that was always like a mind blowing thing to me. Like what's, mm. wh wh what's the disconnect? What happened between right. this person and, you know, a professional athlete? I couldn't understand it. So, so Will... You know, you were kind of asking, all right, if, if, if the way that scientists and academics ascertain information by drawing from a pool of data and the, you know, the, the, the sort of collective pool of knowledge in terms of the best peer reviewed papers, and they use that and they build a mental framework and then they go test variables that are relevant or offshoots of that collective knowledge. How does Naudi measure results and measure things? Is, is, is that the question? That's kind of the question, right? Yeah. Like, uh, I I like that question. I'm gonna play. I, it. You, I, I just got something in the top of sure. my head that can help it. And obviously, the reason I don't look when I do max sprint tests, the reason I don't do max sprint tests outside is simple. To try and get a camera to not shake like crazy when you're running after a client is really hard. And then never mind that. To take them outside, you're going, like you're being paid to work with clients or whatever. And so it's time consuming to even just conduct assessments or whatever. But in time that really the objective is going to be and i'm not quite there yet because i, I want to blow this out of the water that's the whole thing is i don't want this to be kind of like I, I don't want it to be like uh like some asterisks of like okay maybe this is going to work or maybe it doesn't work i want it to work 100 percent of the time i want it to always work and that's that's for me what matters more than anything if i can get a person who is running and then i just get them to run let's say let's say they're running uh 10 miles per hour if i can get that person running to 17 miles per hour that's a way I would measure progress with that person. If they ran at 10 miles an hour for most of their life, 11 miles per hour, most of their life, and then I get that person to run and they've trained and they've worked out and they've done all kinds of different exercises, followed traditionalized protocols, and then I get them to run at 17 or 18 miles per hour, that is a way. That is one way that I would determine that they're, that they're doing better. For me, I, I put up a video. It didn't get that much traction. But I, I threw a ball the other day. It was at, at this machine or whatever, and I'm just, I'm gonna have to assume that it had a speedometer on it, and that the speedometer is fairly accurate. My, my guy uh, Johnny Eblen was with me, and he wasn't throwing the ball anywhere near as fast as I was. But I, I was getting it close to 80 miles per hour. So for me, I would get I would gauge that my progress was improved because for me, about a few years prior to that, I was doing a similar test where I was throwing about 64 miles per hour. 
So if I increase to almost 80 miles per hour, and I think I would have, if I would have had a heavier ball, a slightly heavier ball, mm. I, and I would and I would be able to get more force transfer through my forearm, I probably would have been able to get that thing. I would hope to over 80 miles an hour based upon what those numbers are. Is it to say that that's guaranteed what happened? Maybe the, the speedometer was different. Maybe the measurement tools were different or whatever, perhaps. But the way that I feel with my body is tremendously different. I can feel the ball in my glutes. I can feel the ball in my quads. I can feel it on my feet. And I could not feel that before because I was completely stuck in my lumbar spine and my hips. So with that in mind, that would be a way of measuring progress. Seeing a state change in scoliosis, that's a way of, of measuring progress. So there's performance metrics. If a person's in pain and they're no longer in pain and they happen to be able to run better after the fact, that would be another way of determining uh, progress. Or, 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 And you can quantify that through you know motion capture systems and whatnot. And you can quantify it in terms of running speed. These are all things that can be quantified. Yeah, that's. Uh, I understand that. And that is a result. And that's actually what a lot of guys already do. They, uh, they say, oh, this exercise, let's say Brett Contreras, friend Brett Contreras. He does the uh, glute bridge or whatever it is, the thruster. And says this person ran faster at forty, so therefore the thruster is superior to the squat and the deadlift, no, but, which but we metric against. He conducted a study and it didn't show any 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 increases beyond the margin of error. And, and okay. these people all had thirty five percent increases on their on their squat, deadlift, and hip thruster strength, and they saw no increases beyond the margin of error. So he didn't actually prove that. Okay, you, you'll get. Don't get me wrong. Running coaches will get athletes to run faster weightlifting coaches and physical therapists will not get an athlete to run faster because ultimately it's a technical matter. If your technique isn't on point, then you're not going to run faster. My point is you both have a result at the end. That's, that's better. Okay. But you're doing things the way you described it is intuitive and that doesn't really work with isolating variables as, as much in a scientific study. So how would you isolate the variables that you are getting in order to get that result? How are you going to do that? Because I see that being a problem with quantification because you can, you can capture things on motion capture. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me, let me put it this way. Um, we, we had a discussion about this last night. Evidence. People don't care about evidence. There is no evidence to suggest that Jesus Christ died and then ascended into heaven after three days. No evidence. Yet how many Christians are there on the planet? Billions. They don't care. They care about utility. There's utility in going to church, potentially hooking up and finding your wife or finding your husband. There's utility as it relates to networking. There's utility in, you know, there being a set of rules that, hey, look, if I have a wife, like it's it's actually wrong to pursue my wife. Right. So, so there's like it's the Bible was math. It was a math book. And it was telling you, hey, look, these are the these are in order to keep a functional society going, a somewhat functional society going. Here's a set of rules. However, those rules don't go very far because the people that did the math there didn't do a good enough math. And that's why we're in the predicament that we're in today. That's why Christianity has too it has too many open loops. We're transitioning ourselves into a world where we're going to we're finding better closed loops. And science is a way that we do it. Now, look, people don't care about evidence that goes against their self-interest. They go for evidence that goes towards their self-interest. So let me put it this way. Let's say you're you're a dude. And you got 10 friends, 15 friends, and all your friends, right? Let's say you start doing functional patterns when you're about 20, 28, 29. You start like getting older and you start developing wisdom and you're like, hey, I'm going to start doing functional patterns and not do all the shit that you guys are doing. By the time that guy's around 40 years old, he's going to watch. I'll give you this example. Uh, my, my guy, Bruno, from from uh, from Brazil. It's I don't want to classify it as an anecdote. This is just an analysis. This is a very thoughtful analysis. That's all it is, because the term anecdote means it's kind of implies that you're being lazy with drawing an assumption, which is bullshit, because my assumptions are not lazy. Clearly, obviously, if you look at the results that we produced on so many different populations, it's like, yeah, it's, it's not lazy. But anyway, you know, he, he started doing functional patterns. He could barely move. His knee was so stiff on his right side because he had an ACL injury. And it was just it was a horrible ACL surgery that he had. It just looked like hamburger meat. Pretty much. That's what his knee looked like. It was horrendous. We have video of it. Maybe we'll put it up later. But anyway, um, his friends at the time were kind of like, you're doing this functional pattern stuff, whatever. We'll go to the gym. We'll do our stuff. We'll work out. We'll go off for runs and whatnot. And where are his friends at now? They got beer bellies. Their backs are stiff. Their knees are stiff. And they can't really do much. They used to go surfing together. 
Well, Bruno's over there doing whips. He's contemplating doing aerials on surfing. I used to watch him surf, and it was just it was an abysmal mess. And I didn't want to completely dump on him because he looked so terrible on the surfboard when I first moved out to Hawaii. But now he's starting to do whips. He's starting to do aerials. He's able to run, and he's you know getting closer to sporting a six pack. The only reason the six pack isn't there is because we still have to reorient the way that his lower abdominal wall is positioned. So that way the muscle fibers in the lower abdomen can contract, but that's going to come along for the ride. So so essentially what's happening is all his, all the people that are around him are seeing him look progressively better as he ages while all the people that didn't listen to him are aging in not such a good way. And they, you know, they drink, they like to party. They still like to do stupid shit while Bruno keeps anti-aging. So it just comes down to this. At some stage, the results are going to become so obvious that you're going to literally see one group of people that's doing functional patterns that's clearly regenerating, that has life in their body, that's like run, they're running fast, maybe dunking basketballs. Like, let let me put it this way, Will. If I could dunk a basketball, is anybody going to argue with me anymore if I could do that? Uh, Probably not, but I I mean, that's not the most scientific way to do it. (laughs) Okay. So, so, and and this is, you know, this is... um, I got got to get into this a little bit more. There needs to be more context. So look, science is a tool to convince people. Most of the time, it's to convince people of something that a certain narrative is more important. If you are studying snails, your job, part of your job as a snail scientist is to get to do what? If you want to be successful and getting like funding, what do you have to do? Study snails. <laughs> to, to, to convince people that, that what you're trying to find out is relevant or important in, in some aspect, right? I, I, yes. I think. So, so essentially, whoever is the best salesman, like Andrew Huberman is telling people, hey, just get out in the morning, get about 10 minutes of sunlight or 15 minutes of sunlight in your eyes, and then go out in the evening and do the same thing, and it's going to help your sleep. And I'm like, yeah, until your body adapts to that. And then you, when you still have the same psychological conditions from making the poor decisions that you've done, had in your life, and your mechanics were never addressed, we'll see if that you know sun gazing in the morning and in the evening actually works for you. Mm-hmm. Clearly doesn't. And I've had so many students that did that stuff that it didn't work for but um, to go back to this whole this whole premise, if I am pushing 40 years old and I could never dunk a basketball, and then let's say I'm in my mid-40s and then I start dunking basketballs, ultimately what it's going to com- communicate to everybody else is that I'm doing something that nobody else has ever done before. And it's going to be very difficult to argue against that position. I mean, you could say, hey, there's no science to back this up, but people are, how, how would I put it? People are, what's the word that I'm, impressionable, right? That would make quite the lasting impression, right? That if I could maybe get that woman with Parkinson's disease who's 88 years old to not just be able to walk better the way that she already, to actually just walk and get out of the wheelchair, yeah. for one, right? Forget, like just, but what if I could get that lady to start jogging a mile or two miles? Who's going to win that one in the end? It's it's like, do do you do you drive in cars or do you drive in scientific, like in scientific study mobiles? Which one do you drive? <laughs> like, well, so, the, the, so, so the I want to, I want to slow down. I want to slow down and, and yeah. just kind of bring it back to something, right? Cause we're, we're talking about, you know, when, like, what do people care about? People don't care about evidence. The whole premise of this episode was kind of like, what is the nature of evidence, right? So you're talking about yes. you know, Bruno, Bruno is like aging backwards. You're talking about, you know, making plans to dunk basketballs into your forties, which is something no one has really done before in terms of like, you know, continuing to progress in athleticism as you age. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's mind boggling stuff, right? When you use the word anecdote, an anecdote, the definition of an anecdote is an account regarded as unreliable or as hearsay, right? And that's, that's what the definition is, uh, in terms of like a dictionary definition, when people well, talk about my, anecdotal my... evidence, right? So, and, and just, 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 to hear, let, I, I'm going to play this out a little bit. I'm going to get, get some fr- framework yeah, yeah. and kind of tie some things together here from that, that, what we've been talking about, right? So, you know, anecdotal evidence in that sense is like, is something like saying, well, Bruno's friends are all getting pot bellies and he's getting more ripped and more jacked. And, you know, like you can see, you can see the, the reverse trend. That's anecdotal evidence because there's no, uh, because it's not tied to a scientific institution. They're not measuring for certain variables. There are confounding factors that you can say, you couldn't, you can blame, you couldn't say it's like, oh, well, it's only FP. You could be like, oh, well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe Bruno just uh, has different, gene- you know, you could, I'm not saying that at all, but that's the, that's the logic, right? Um, but then, Anthony, I have to, I have to step in and just say, I would get that if I was only talking about Bruno, but when it's thousands of other people, right. So, getting so, the same so this thing, is like, 
this is why this is why what is what is the nature of evidence right you have you have replicable results that are happening over and over and over again right and so i think the result i think one of the challenges one of the criticisms that people could kind of uh, come to with fp is like well what results are you measuring what what you know what replicable results are you measuring what variables are you accounting for because this is the science this is the academic approach and we'll like throw some throw some stuff in here and like interrupt me at any point with no i think you're on the right train with this that's kind of where i was going too yeah Yeah, keep going you know the way that the way that scientists and the way that the academic community think about things is they isolate variables to reduce for potential confounding factors where they could create a more precise cause and effect relationship with things, right? Now, what's interesting about FP is FP gets a fuck ton of results, right? You go on the Instagram page, you're seeing all these people who have a variety of dysfunctions, correcting their dysfunctions, running better, throwing better, uh, people who have stage five Parkinson's, stepping out of a wheelchair and walking on their own. These are all like very tangible, visible evidence of results. They're all really, really good things. Now, you know- evidence. Just it's it's evidence in general. Now, you know, what the what the um what the nature of evidence is, you know, is is the thing that's in question. It's terms of how how an academic would look at reliable evidence versus how the public looks at reliable evidence. Yeah. I would say the public would look at FP and what FP is doing and look at the look at a page full of the results see the visual changes and they would count that as evidence. Here's thousands, hundreds of thousands of people getting better function, looking better, losing fat, getting more muscle, running faster, throwing faster. They would look at that and they'd be like, that's great. Now, the criticism comes from people who have vested interests in academics, maintaining a particular paradigm. When we when you're talking about like, okay, guys who are doing back squats aren't necessarily doing something wrong, but they're only doing it right from within this particular framework. Well, this particular framework contains the uh, the, the, the hierarchical status of physiotherapists, of academics, of people who are operating on a certain paradigm. And as soon as you want to broaden the scope, the reason that you're broadening the scope is you're challenging their first principles. You're challenging the nature of what they build their arguments on, right? So you're basically, you're, you're taking, you're, you're basically saying, Hey, like I'm going to operate on different first principles. The way that we're going about it based on these other first principles are getting all of these results. People will try to discredit the results and, and, you know, claim it on, on other, like, I think the stupidest thing that I've ever seen ever was a physiotherapist trying to discredit functional patterns by saying it's like oh yeah but like if you just leave pain alone most pain resolves on its own you can't say the functional patterns about these results in helping people with their pain okay you know so, so, like so, so with, with that in mind so with that in mind what percentage of the population does this constitute that would see things like that like do you think that somebody like andrew huberman is going to look at my results and be like well that clearly is con artistry you think he's going to look at that and be like, oh, no, that's that's bullshit. I don't think so. I think he's going to look at that and be like, no, that's legit. What I don't like is the fact that now he carries an intolerant attitude towards everybody else in the industry because he feels that they aren't making a contribution. That's the constant theme. Goda was the one that got highlighted on that uh, on that Liber King uh, expose, right? They got highlighted on that. Why didn't I get highlighted? Because... The dude from more dates from more plates or whatever his name is, Derek, he understands that perspective is not going to age well because they all respect what I'm doing. All of them do, virtually all of them. Even those physios are like, it's not that we don't like functional patterns or we don't think that it works. And I've talked to so many physios, they're like, clearly it works. Clearly it works. We just don't like the fact that you're intolerant because you say that stretching doesn't really actually solve anything. And I'm like, it doesn't doesn't solve for anything the way that you guys do it. it. It's not applicable. It doesn't respect the said principle. And the said principle is essentially, it is sprouted from relativity. And so for me, it, it's it, the said principle eliminates absolutes. And what you're saying is that stretching is absolutely going to fix people. And you guys treat it as such all across the board. Might it help somebody at a certain stage in training? Perhaps at the beginning of the stages, maybe in a transition it might, but overall it's not going to solve anything. People don't. People have no issues with functional patterns and the ways that we get our results at all. The issue that exists is the fact that I'm intolerant and I won't do the squats. And I'll just tell you guys point blank. You guys know why I don't entertain other training? I used to. I used to try other people's stuff. And then guess what ends up happening? I end up getting hurt. My knees get bugged out. My lower back gets bugged out. 
because I do the stupid shit that they tell me to do. I think I told you guys about the story about me putting the electrodes on my quads, right? Did I ever tell you guys yeah. about that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the consequence of it. So of course I'm going to be intolerant. These guys don't understand what they're doing. They didn't go through the same testing that I had to go through. I had to go through a lot to have to figure out what works from what doesn't. And if I, if I, let me put it this way, somebody just gets out of college and they're, they're an electrician or whatever, right? They've never actually really done that much electrical work. Who's gonna have more, more value? The guy that never went to uh, school to become an electrician who's been doing it for 30 years or the guy that just got out of college? That's mm. what I feel like people are in this industry. They don't have any relevant experience. First and foremost, and I, th- this was a main question that I asked Brett Contreras, the last one, and he didn't even realize that it was kind of like a self-ownage. When I said, if everybody wanted to train in relation to their biological traits, standing, walking, running, and throwing, would you train them for that? And he said, yes, of course I would do that. Ultimately, what it comes down to is that science doesn't care about public approval. I don't care about public approval. And I know that people don't like when I call myself a scientist. But the truth of the matter is, I don't care about public approval. I have hurt myself business-wise by make, taking the path that I have because I never wanted to compromise my research. So that's why I never did all the other nonsensical shit that everybody else pushed up on me. It's because I, my, my research, I don't, like, I don't ever use this word because I think it's corny and the people that use this word annoy the hell out of me. But my research is sacred to me. I, I get emotional thinking about it because it's like, it's the thing that keeps me saying this shit is everything to me and for anybody to take that you will literally have to put a bullet you'd have to put a bullet in my fucking face before i get rid of my research there's no there's no ways around that and i'm sure and and are there going to be people that would never understand that they're either going to think that i'm crazy yes but the results speak for themselves the results speak for themselves look at what the rewards are for me engaging in the research that i have so when people say, oh, you know what? Now he's not a scientist. He's not scientific. Bro, I don't care what people think. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do care what people think. If I piss off the angry mob enough to get them to kill me, I'm gonna, there's going to be a limit as to how far I'm going to piss them off, right? You have to anger them to such a degree to pay attention, but you're not going to anger them enough to kill you. But ultimately, if there was no, if there was no cancel culture and you, and you didn't have to worry about that and there was no way that you were going to get killed, I would literally not care what anybody thinks. I wouldn't give a shit at all what what anybody thinks. But what people don't what people don't recognize is that there's a punishment that comes directly with being intolerant to non-scientific approaches. And we all know Huberman knows this, Lex Friedman knows this, Rogan knows this, the Weinsteins know this, Peterson knows this, Sam Harris knows this. They all understand that peer review, for the most part, is a scam. It is. It's like the people that do the peer review. When they say you can, if you can't do, what do you do? You teach. But it's not to say that I'm going to bash on all of science. I'm just going to bash on the science that relates to the study of human beings. That's the science that I'm going to bash because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. It's contextual. The said principle applies to behaviorism all across the board, not just for training. It it accounts for our psychology. It accounts for pretty much everything. When you think when you really think about it, it accounts for everything as it relates to conditioning human beings or even conditioning animals. It matters for everything. And these the people that are in the field of science, they completely disregard the said principle. Andrew Huberman will say, hey, you know, if you have body fat issues, it's not about learning moderation or sourcing out your behaviors. I think he'll say that, but he'll also say, jump on a bike and pedal like if a lion's chasing after you. And I'm like, uh, bro, you know what you're like the, the body itself, right? One of the, one of its fundamental, uh, the brain itself, one of its fundamental things, one of the fundamental aspects of what the brain does is try and relate to its own gravitational field. It tries to balance itself out, right? So the more imbalanced you are, the harder it becomes to think, the harder it becomes to regenerate, the harder it becomes to heal. And that's a basic first principle. That It's just like, that's like, it, it makes no sense to have a house that's built. That's why you don't see houses. That, that's why the government says, hey, look, bro, you can, yes, you can build a house that tilts this way, but if it tilts like this too much, then guess what? We're not going to let you do that because it's not up to code. It makes more sense for you to respect physics. That's what makes more sense. And so for me, when I think about what the scientific community thinks, I don't care what they think. It's irrelevant. They don't matter because they're most of the time politicians. That's just how it is. They're politicians. And so 
when it's all said and done, I'm like, I, I'm not the type of individual who's going to be like, oh man, like I want approval from the scientific community. I, I don't care whether Huberman ever gives me a plug or whether Rogan ever give me a plug. What I care about is having to deal with the consequences that come from them conditioning people to think the way that they do. When David Cog Goggins conditions people to think the way that they do, to just push to be like, hey, look, I'm going to inject myself with a bunch of Novocaine and then run until I smash my knees to oblivion. And then now I have to reform my tibia. There's some like that makes it difficult for, for Will. Does that make it a bit of a difficulty for you to solve problems when people come in with that kind of psychology? You tell uh, me. Bro. Abso absolutely. And how about this? If somebody's just coming into the game, they want to know about functional patterns and you, you obviously know that there's an issue of charlatanism and, and you're naming uh, a few off the bat, right? How do I, I know other than results? I wouldn't call them charlatans, bro. I, I, let me put it this way. It's, it's, we all, we all play to contribute in one way, one way, shape or form or the other. And I think that they, at some level, these people do believe they're making a contribution. I think that's where they see what functional patterns does. I don't think that they believe that anymore. Well, ultimately, I, I think it just comes down to that. They're like, you know what? People don't want it. They've accepted that people don't want to change that much or that they can't change. And that there's no sense in trying to change them. So they're just people that I think have kind of given up on people as, as brutal as I am with people, bro, as hard as I push on them. And as, as much of a stern person as I appear to be, I have hope that people are going to be able to figure this out. And if I didn't, I wouldn't keep trying to figure this out. I don't give up easily, bro. That's just not my, my whole thing, but sorry, i interrupted you. I think, Will, what were you saying? No, I, I was saying there is an issue with, uh, charlatanism in, you know, therapy yes. there th that exists. Right. So other than results, how would somebody know that FP is the real deal? Let's say compared to human garage or something like that, where it's like okay. twist this way and, and your um, get into fetal position and your nervous system will be changed. Now I, I don't really buy that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm like, Hmm, that seems a little, that, that claim is ridiculous. Right. But he seems very persuasive when he says it and he can show results. So as somebody independent, how do I know short -term, acute short-term results, right? Which, yes. which we're talking about people caring about evidence. If a person sees an acute short-term result, does uh, he have anybody with Parkinson's disease changing, changing in the way that we show it or somebody with cerebral palsy? There's your answer, right? Um, I'm just saying that people do come in and see that and say, Hey, that guy's getting results. That guy's getting results. That guy's claiming results. Um, and, and that's your answer, I guess, right? That, results I mean, this is the this is a thing will like uh it's like not everybody is going to attain the wisdom needed to figure this out that's just how it is that's fair and it, it's natural selection that's what it is some people think that they can get away with clapping nature across the face but nature nature takes tabs bro it takes tabs it's a system of checks and balances that's all it is. And the more that you disrespect that system of checks and balances, the more that nature is going to funnel you down this path of being able to do less and less with your body as you get older. So you can keep ignoring nature. This is the, the document I was talking about, Alfred Korzybski. It, it really just boils down to that. Right now we are in the, in the confused, the first period of where we were was that we were absolutists, right? We were, um, religion convinced us that the, that the universe revolved around the earth and we were center of reality right and then in the transition science came in and then right now there's a there's a battle between theism and atheism i guess you could say right and right now we're in the confused absolutist period right what we're moving into is a relativist period the said principle period that's that's the period that we're moving into that's when we move into a type one civilization not everybody's going to make it to that other side however i will say that what what, what my job is what my my whole contribution to this isn't necessarily being the most articulate person or being the most liked person clearly because i'm not necessarily well liked by anybody other than people I, i'm either you really really dislike me or you really really like adore me it's kind of one or the other i guess I, like in that sense people would say that i have like a cult following or whatever it's up to me to provide more staggering evidence i think i already have i think and people are already accepting it if you look at the like what that that result that 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 woman got I think it's probably got like 450,000 views on it and it's probably like 25,000 likes. Pretty good numbers. Pretty good numbers, right? So the, the, the public is already speaking. But I, honestly, guys, I don't care what people think. I care about the standard. Like people see a bar, right? And whatever society says that, that where that bar is lifted is where you adjust yourself to. 
I said, yeah, wipe away that bar. I feel like people's standards are already too low. They're down here, right? I don't care. Like, let me, let me put, just, let me just reframe this as well. I don't live my life to get approval from other people. I, I live life to get approval from my body. That's what I, that's what I live for. So whether people choose to accept what I have to say or not, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that I get on the other side of this problem. I've made enough money to where I could be comfortable the rest of my life. And the way that I spend money isn't like extravagant. I, I have relative to how I live. I already have fuck you money. Right. And I have a fuck you lifestyle as well. This is how I operate. So with that in mind, does that diminish my passion towards wanting to pursue this in any way? No, I'm more motivated now than I've ever been in my entire career. And as the time ticks and time passes forward, I'm only more motivated, not because I care about what, oh, well, this is what the scientific community is going to think, or this is what physical therapists are going to think, or this is what the public is going to think. I don't give a shit. For me, the research is the holy grail. That's what it is for me. I, I just want to continue to keep doing what I'm doing, bro. And whether people choose to accept it or not is irrelevant. I don't care. I don't give a shit. I make a good living. And no matter what I do, bro, whether I run functional patterns or not, or let's say functional patterns gets shut down, I'll say, hey, guys, I'll go on Instagram and be like, hey, guys, I'm taking on clients and I'm going to charge 200, 200 bucks an hour. I'm going to be book solid. I won't even have to worry about having clientele. I'm pretty much set for life, bro. So right now, I'm not even living for the whole purpose of what can I contribute to the world. I'm just not happy with where my body's at. I'm not happy with, with where I am physically. It's not, it's not good enough. I look at my dogs running around and I look at how high they can jump and how fast they can run and what their output is. And then I look at my output and it's abysmal. And then I look at the output of human beings and it's also abysmal. It's a problem. And ultimately, I, I don't need people to tell me that there's a problem. Nature's already communicating to communicating it to me every fucking day with every hair that I have that grows gray. I'm like, holy shit, bro. You need to hurry the fuck up, Naughty, because you're aging. You are aging in some ways and you seem to be anti-aging. But in other ways, bro, you are still aging. Though that one that floater that you have in this eye over here, you need to get rid of that. And you need to address your cranial compression and actually get to the source of this if you're going to fix that. The Grim Reaper is breathing down my neck at all times. And I can see it it's like right there. And I'm like, oh, there's the Grim Reaper. OK, so the question is, I hope that the Grim Reaper, the Grim Reaper is I, I feel like in a, in a difficult position. And I'm not trying to be a conspiracy nut or whatever, but I, I have had a concern in the, in the past that what I was discovering was so fundamental that it might get me killed. That it's so fundamental and it's so fucking radical that it might get me killed. Scary thoughts that I've had. Right. And so I've been trying to juggle getting killed by people or getting killed by uh, by aging. So the Grim Reaper is always present in my mind. Death is the driver to my behavior. That's the driver, not people's stupid positions, not their stupid suppositions. I don't care about that. That's not how I orient myself. That's not, and uh, whether that's scientific or not, I don't care. I don't ascribe to that. It just doesn't make sense to live in any other way. You guys see what I mean? It doesn't make sense for me to be like, hey, okay, well, I'm, a, I'm going to, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ascribe to what scientific principles because science is my religion and that's how I'm going to do it. It just seems to make sense to me because I think that life is, is we're living in a simulator and that there's complicated math that connects to it, right? George Bull, the laws of thought, I'm eventually going to get into studying that. And I'm sure I'm going to find that this guy probably understood this as well. People like him figured this out a long time ago that essentially there's a game of checks and balances and that it's all mathematical. And that the sloppier your math is, the more remainders you're going to have on your equations. And those remainders are the pains, the aches, the anxiety, the depression, the low testosterone, right? All that stuff is what comes, the cancer, the disease, all that stuff comes because you're doing bad math. So my life is just about doing good math, trying to find closed loop systems. Is that the accurate term, by the way, if I say a closed loop system? You guys see what I mean by that? I think so. It's kind of yeah. like, it's kind of like, imagine that I, I, I put solar panels in my house. But then I'm like, I'm, I'm like burning energy in a bunch of different areas or whatever. And I don't have enough solar panels, so I'm still bleeding energy. And now I have to tap into the grid. I feel like tapping to the grid is part of an open, open loop system. When right. you look at that functional patterns logo, right? I don't have one on this shirt. But when you look at that functional patterns logo, it's really just a closed loop with a piece missing in it. And what functional patterns is, is what I'm trying to do is take that piece and bring it to the, to the whole circle. So it brings everything full circle. And Will just, uh, his battery got exhausted. Hopefully he can make it back in. 
Um, but um, yeah, for me, it's it's about trying to, to establish closed loop systems that work. That's 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 my job, and they're always improving. They're always changing. And my my position is that I don't necessarily um, I don't necessarily I don't spend my time concerned about what other people think, so long as they're not going to kill me. That's that's essentially it. So long as they don't kill me, and so long as I don't have the angry mob that wants to kill me, so long as I don't have corporate executives, and so long as they're not like a, um, a, a conspiracy to to kill me, then I don't give a shit what people think. Right. I couldn't give two fucks what anybody thinks. So that's kind of my my take on on the whole perspective of well, how do you expect science to pick up what you're going to do? It's like it's going to be a force of nature. The thing is, you're not. It's going to be hard. Eventually, it's going to get so ridiculous to people to say, you're saying that functional patterns doesn't work? Bro, all you do is just put up like tutorials of these stretches or whatever. What all these guys do is just post these things that appear to be impossible to do. I, let me, and I'm going to ask you this, Will. Could most physical therapy pr protocols do what, what we do with functional patterns in terms of changing people's gait cycles? Max, uh, I, I don't think I, I don't think most physiotherapy protocols are for changing gait cycles. I think it's looking at a problem, uh, putting it into a part, and, and then that, that's a philosophical framework is that mm -hmm. the body is made of parts. So fix the part, give an exercise for the part, and that's pretty much it, right? So yeah, I think I just physical therapists and, and chiros that go beyond that, but the standard is fix the part, give an exercise for the part. And you see this on social media. It's like three exercises that will get your mid traps if you have – mid trap pain and then it's like you know wise tease uh <laughs> the basics right so that's all over the place so guys i, yeah, so I, I, I yeah, hold ahead, on hold on i i have to wrap up this a little bit and i want to throw some bones to some of the people who are in the chats who have been asking some questions um mm -hmm. you know natty when we were talking about um the idea of like how you determine how a person can improve you have this sort of vision of the archetype of how they could move and and you contrast that against what you're seeing in front of you, right? You see them move, you kind of see what it would look like. Do you have a vision yourself of uh, like the ideal human archetype and how they would run? Like, do you have a, do you have a model of, of gait that you consider optimal in your head? Do you, are there characteristic traits that you look for where it's like, this I is mean, exactly bro, what I, I want to see? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. But if you could blend something like a, a Bo Jackson, Barry Sanders, and Usain Bolt together – You'd have a pretty good gait cycle for the most part. I, I would have what, to assume. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Um, you know, can we take some like tangible behaviors that you see in them that you wouldn't see in your average Joe or Jane that you could kind of like, you know, like just just a few like tangible ideas. All right, I'll give you. I'll I'll, I'll drop you guys. I'll, I'll drop the audience and know. Just th okay. just throw them a bone here. <laughs> okay. The the chat's been going come off. A point when people hit the ground, when most people, especially Europeans, I myself included, when they hit the ground, the ribs flare out, right? But they never recoil back in. That's that's the main one. When you look at people from Africa, when you look at people who are, uh, I guess, African from African ancestry, then the ones that do it right. Um, it's like, how, how do I put it? You know, when they talk about like bracing your core, I think this is where Stuart McGill and people like that get it from. So it's nothing really, really that new. It's just, it's like the spine is still moving. I, what, I, what I would say is that like, you know what, let's, let's just get into this. I'll just say this, that the spine does move as it relates when you, when you're running clearly. And I've been teaching this for a ridiculously long time. And even people, when they used to say, you teach a standing, standing neutral position and you tell people to walk with the stiff spine the whole time. I'm like, uh, no, I don't. If the spine has to move, but it has to move in very small increments. That's what I'll say that it needs to move in small increments for, and the whole spine needs to move in small increments, not a section that moves in, in small increments. And then the other one, move. let me put it this way. If the spine doesn't have small, if it's not moving incrementally in small, like in, if it's not moving in small increments through the entire way, what you're going to get is excessive motion to compensate for that. So essentially you get excessive motion, let's say in the thoracic spine, and then a loss of motion in the lumbar spine. That's typically how it works. And so really with most people, what they don't realize is like what, what they're dealing with is, is constant longitudinal compression, a smashing of their spine and their pressure, the pressure... The pressure goes out laterally, and, and but the pressure goes out laterally, but it never comes back inwardly, right? So it's like so people's pelvic floors 
they're like this. They're overly expanded, right? Their rib cage in certain areas, overly expanded, and in other areas, overly compressed. And in some parts of the pelvis, it's also going to be overly compressed. If I could say that there's one common trait out of all really, I, got, I would just say like um, African-based movers, I guess you would say, right? Is that they all operate with a mostly, I almost don't want to say, it, it's like mostly a neutral spine, mostly, but the, but it moves when it moves, but it moves in a segmental fashion on every freaking vertebra when they move, but it's not a massive motion most of the time. But that said, that's it. That's for me. I think that that's optimal. And you're supposed to figure out if you're going to wrestle from that foundation. But if you look at like Russian wrestlers, their spines, it's like, you could still, you could still get the, the spine to incrementally, incrementally move in bigger ranges of motion. But then you're, if you do, if the spine moves too big incrementally in every single vertebra, you're going to end up with really short legs. There's a probability that that's going to happen. Do you guys kind of see what I'm getting at with that? Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying this is it. I'm just simply telling you how I process the information or whatever. So like if the legs are really long, the probability is the spine is going to move less. If the legs are really, really short, the spine is going to move more. My legs, I got little nubs. I got two nubs for legs that I hate looking at every single day. And because of that is why I probably, if I would commit myself to wrestling, I would probably be a pretty good wrestler. Or if I fought, I would probably be a decent fighter. And it's because I, because martial arts caters to people who can whip their spines really freaking well. But it also okay, but it still has if you get LeBron James to go into MMA and he committed to that even right now at the age that he's at, within five years he would probably be a world champion. There's I would have very few doubts about that. So when it's all said and done, I believe that the blueprint starts in Africa and it ends in Africa. Like that's that's the blueprint for for a human body. And there's certain archetypical molds that, that they have. I, I think that uh like what what has happened in Europe because of grain consumption, because of famines, because of disease, because of trauma, it's kind of, we've kind of become a little bit of a distortion. And I include myself into that. I, like my nose is a distortion. My mouth is a distortion. My eyes are a distortion. I'm a distortion. And so if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be honest about it, there's, there's a characteristic to the formation of, of, of African torsos that makes more sense than anything else that I've seen. That would be one thing. I don't know if that helps at all. I don't even know if any of that was good. I do the best that I can, but I'm not good at explaining stuff unless I'm like in teaching people chamber sequences. When I teach, there's a reason that I have a cult following. There's a reason for that because when I bring somebody into an HBS course and they see how I explain things, they're like, holy shit, this all makes so much sense. It's easier to explain the physics of it when you're in the laboratory with people and you're do- doing it step by step. It's really hard to do that when the people, you guys are educated clearly, obviously, but it, it's, it's, it's easier to do that when you can explain things in context, but to try and explain it in a general context, to ex- ex- try, try and explain general tendency and, uh, in context is really fucking hard. I don't, I don't know if that even makes sense or not. Yeah, it does. It sounds like, you know, a lot of the times you're looking at individual uh, patterns of like behavior and trying to codify that into general terms is, is fairly difficult to do, you know, and, and I, I get that. Right. So, um, you know, thanks. Thanks for answering for some of those questions. Will, you know, in terms of, um, I know we, we, we went in a lot of different directions in this conversation. Were there any, like, those are really, 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 I love it. I, I like this. Yeah. Any, <laughs> any core theses that you kind of wanted to boomerang back to and sort of, uh, you know, kind of put like a bow on top of just before we wrap this up here? Ooh, core thesis. Uh, not really. I like where this uh, conversation went. I, I kind of like the freestyle approach. And, you know, we got we into to what science. We have to do more of these. We have to do this more like we have. I think we still have to do a few more of these maybe to get more ideas out. You get what I mean? Hundred percent, hundred percent. No, I, I like that. We'll uh, we'll come back and do a, a third episode on this, and uh, I still have half the presentation to go, so <laughs> we could pivot off that and and just go with that. I'm game, definitely. I'm yeah. and, game, uh, I had a, I had a great time. I, uh, yeah, this is like really good, really good discussion. Yeah, thank super, you, guys. super fun. So so guys, if you're watching on YouTube and you want to you know ask us some specific questions, leave a comment. If you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, leaving us a review really really helps. It helps. Uh, the algorithm and what have you. You can follow me at Anthony.Manuel, M-A-N-U-E-L-E on Instagram. Follow Will at The Art of Move. You can follow Naudi at Naudi Aguilar and also follow the Functional Patterns page at Functional Patterns. Thank you so much for listening to The Art of Move podcast. We really enjoy doing these episodes. It's really, really cool. 
uh, getting Naudi back on here, and we're going to have him on, you know, presumably a few more times to continue this discussion. Because even at close to two hours, I feel like we barely scratched the surface here, guys. So thank you so much for listening. We'll do more. And, uh, you know, we'll catch you on the next episode of The Art of Move. Have a good one, guys. Take care, guys.